So I now like to invite Estefania Custodio. She will be uh, making a presentation about measuring dietary outcomes with minimum dietary diversity for women. Tania, uh, Stefania, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us a space to talk about the minimum dietary diversity for women indicator and to share with you the outcomes of a workshop that happened earlier this week about the status and opportunities of this indicator. So I would like to start my presentation by recovering one of the messages that Carlo gave about going beyond hunger, and I would add to add beyond malnutrition, and measuring not only the problems and consequences of the immediate intermediate causes that we have a morbidity or mortality, or even malnutrition, but take a step back and also measure the causes that would help us to guide action. So I've heard here these two days to talk a lot about the poor diets and what is the impact on morbidity, malnutrition, and mortality, so I would not go into depth on that. But I would like to give a message that I haven't heard here, and I think it's very relevant for the session, that is no single indicator in the SDGs who actually collect diet quality. We have heard Carlo talking about the food access indicators, but we don't have, not even in the SDG 3 about health, not in SDG 2 about food, we don't have indicators that reflect diet quality. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons may be that the gold standards to measure diet, the gold standards for nutrition, may be costly and complex. It's true that a gold standard measurement of diet requires an extensive interview. If we can also weight the food that is consumed, transform it into ingredients, macro and micronutrients, and that is seen, and it's in complex. However, we are lucky, and as a result of a strong and rising demand for simple and feasible indicators that reflect at least one dimension of diet quality, we have the dietary diversity indicators, which are a result of a strong, solid, rigorous scientific work, but give us simple tools to be used. So I have here a table of some of the dietary diversity indicators used at population level that you might be familiar with. And they all come, this table comes from the guidelines of MDDW, which I really recommend you to look at if you are interested in the in indicator. So in this table, the first thing I would like to speak of is the Household Dietary Diversity Score. The Household Dietary Diversity Score is a dietary diversity indicator, but it doesn't have a nutritional meeting, and that is very important to state. So it is an indicator at household level, but for us nutritionists to give a, a nutrition value to a food-based indicator, we need to know who is consuming that food. We need to know what are the nutritional needs of the person consuming that food in order to give the nutritional meaning. So Household Dietary Diversity Score is a proxy of food access, but not a, food, a proxy of a nutrition. Then we have two population groups that have dietary diversity indicators validated. One of them is children, 6 to 23 months. That is the minimum dietary diversity for children. And then we have women of reproductive age, 15 to 49. So the first indicator that women had was the women dietary diversity score that was based in nine food groups. And it was a continuous variable from zero to nine. So the higher the score, the higher the likelihood of reaching the, minimum, the micronutrient adequacy. However, and again, as a result of a strong demand for institutions, and the EU was one of those institutions, we wanted that indicator that was easier to communicate. And that's how the minimum dietary diversity for women came in 2014. So what is the minimum dietary diversity for women indicator? It is the proportion of women 15 to, 19, 15 to 49 years of age who consumed food items from at least five of, out of 10 defined food groups the previous day or night. So here the scientific work was to decide which were the 10 food groups in which we had to distribute the food items and what was the minimum that, we, uh, that could be, uh, give us information about the minimum required, that was five. So it is important to say that this indicator is collected at individual level, but is interpreted at population level. That is that if I take you as a group of women of reproductive age and ask you, how many of these 10 food groups you consumed yesterday, what I can say is a high percentage of you have consumed five or more food groups. You as a group have a higher likelihood of reaching your macronutrient adequacy, but I cannot use it as for individual screening. Now, what is the role that MDDW can play in the SDG2? Well, for me, there is one that is very important, and that can be a bridge or a meeting point between nutrition and food security dimension. What do I mean by that? 
we would have at the left the food security dimensions that food security measures, like food production, food storage, how food is prepared, and as far as they would go is the food intake, the food consumption. However, for us nutrition, everything starts with food intake. So once the food enters the body, what happens, how it interacts with the physiology of the person, etc., would give us the nutritional status. So it's a meeting point between the two dimensions, and I think that it's a, a strength point for it. And that is why also why it can inform both the two first targets of SDG2, because it's talking to us about our nutritious food and also and at the same time is addressing the nutritional needs of women of reproductive age. However, even if this point I see it a very strong point, it can also be a weakness. And I'm thinking about when we try to advocate for MDDW to be included in any of those two targets, that when we want to talk to agencies or institutions with a food security mandate, you know, they would say, yes, this is a great indicator, we certainly need it under SDG 2, let's put it under target 2.2, because it's so related to nutrition. But then when you talk to the agencies or institutions with a nutrition mandate, they said, yes, this is a great indicator, we certainly need an indicator of diet quality, let's put it under target 2.1, because it's food security related. No, because each of the institutions wanted to keep their you know, food security or nutrition indicators like stunting weights, and et cetera. So there is another indirect uh, added, added value of MDDW for this SDG2 that is related to stunting and wasting. When we look at it with a thousand days approach and how the nutritional status of women can have an impact in the newborn nutritional status that can be reflected afterwards in stunting and wasting. However, I'm not going to say that MDDW is perfect. Of course it's not, and we are well aware. One of the things is that it only collects one dimension of diet quality, which is dietary diversity. So it's not reflecting on the quantities of the food consumed. It's not reflecting on moderation, on consumption of salt or free sugars, or not in the balance of quality of macronutrients. And that would be very much related to the overweight and obesity epidemic that we heard yesterday, and we urgently need indicators for that. It's also not appropriate for individual screening, as I told you, and it should not be used as basis for dietary guidelines because it's not how it was uh, created for. And we all know that no single indicator is sufficient for all. However, what we have learned from the workshop that took place in the, earlier this week is that the indicator is being useful and it's being used. So we have here uh, the map of the countries that came up from the workshop that we did, and already 10 countries are collecting MDDW information at national level. And as reflecting this multi-sectorial nature of this indicator, we see that it has been included in the household budget survey at Tajikistan. In the DHA survey in Nigeria, it's, they are collecting the data right now. Also in a CVSVA food security survey in Rwanda, micronutrient survey in Nepal. So it can be integrated in many different surveys from different nature. It had also been included as an impact evaluation indicator in many countries, already in 21 countries. It is one of the key indicators of the German Cooperation Agency for the Food Security and Nutrition Global Project, GIZ. It is also one of the WFP corporate indicators for measuring nutrition sensitive intervention, and the EU has also incorporated the monitoring and evaluation framework of the programs that are dealing with resilience, food security, and nutrition. There are also 30 countries that plan to implement this uh, indicator next year. Also, USAID, Feed the Future. It's moving from WDDS to MDDW next year, implementing in the two countries they work on. So, sorry. And finally, the opportunities. That is also what we learned from the workshop. So, we learned that it can be used for assessment of diet quality at national and subnational levels. It's suitable for integration in large-scale surveys. It has also been introduced in the MIX survey. It can be compared with previous assessment as long as we take into account seasonality, which is very important to take into account. And as a summary, it can fill the gap of a food-based indicator for use in target setting, advocacy, and impact evaluation of nutrition-sensitive action. It can inform on effective policy and improving diets and nutrition of women of reproductive age. So let me just finish with the last slide just thanking you all and thanking also the organizing team of the workshop, which is the result of this presentation. Maria Antonia Tuatson, Alexander Tung from the Nutrition and Food Systems Division and Francois Cayeta Kire from the Joint Research Center and all the participants of the workshop earlier this week, especially the last two slides are populated with their contributions. Thank you very much. <laughs>